For more than three centuries, Worcester's newspapers have played an important role in the recording of its day-to-day -day history. In this series, we'll take a deep dive into the archives to uncover some of the fascinating stories documented within, in Worcester's printed past. In 1862, members of the Archaeological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland convened in Worcester for their annual congress. Over the course of a week, members attended various lectures held in and around the city, on subjects ranging from Bishop Wolfston to Evesham Abbey and Simon de Montfort. On Tuesday the 29th of July 1862, the congregation took a tour about Worcester, visiting many of the notable historic buildings in the city. More than 150 years on, much of what they recorded endures and may still be enjoyed today. St Andrew's Church So noted for its beautiful taper spire, which rises to the height of 245 feet, the tower itself being 90 feet, this was rebuilt in 1751 by Nathaniel Wilkinson, a stonemason of Worcester, the old spire, which may have been of equal beauty, having been destroyed by lightning. There was an old structure here in the 11th century, impropriate to the Abbey of Evesham, which must have been destroyed. The history of the erection of the lofty spire and the portion of the structure beneath it was unknown, but Mr Walker suggested that it had been intended to build a cruciform church, of which the tower would have been the centre, but the design was not completed. How the tower and the spire came to be built first was unexplained. Mr Parker of Oxford, who was one of the party, and brought his well-known acumen to bear upon every edifice he saw, said the interior work under the tower was very late pointed of Henry VII, or perhaps even of Henry VIII's time. The renovation of the chancel by Mr Perkins, recently finished, was noticed with approbation, as were the eastern memorial window of stained glass, placed there by Josiah Stallard Esquire, to the memory of his parents, and the work of Rogers of this city. Much of St Andrews was sadly demolished in the late 1940s. The tower, with its iconic spire, remained standing although the tip of Nathaniel Wilkinson's of 1751 was itself later replaced. The original can be seen standing on the west side of the tower. The interior underside of the tower, identified by Mr Parker as being late 15th or early 16th century, may still be seen and serves to contrast the appearance of the late medieval tower with the later refacing. Although Josiah Stallard's memorial window is no more, Nearby may still be seen his name, connected with the family business, which remains in close proximity to the former church. Next, the party moved on to nearby St Albans Church. St Albans Church Mr Walker read a short paper on its early history, and Mr Parker remarked on the transition Norman character of the arches of the nave. The original Norman windows of the north side of the church remain, but the southern walls and windows have been rebuilt in modern times. It is the most ancient parish church of Worcester, and by the efforts of the present incumbent has been restored in a very satisfactory manner. The east window of three lights in vignettes of coloured glass by Hardman has here a very good effect. The font is of Norman date. This is the only parish church of Worcester where daily service is still performed. Like St Andrews, the character of St Albans' surroundings have changed a great deal since 1862, but the description of the building's architecture remains largely accurate. Although it was declared redundant in 1976, the church continues to serve an important function for the community of Worcester. Passing up Fish Street, the old timber houses and carved gables of which elicited some attention and remark, 
The party proceeded to the commandery, which R. M. Mentz Esquire, the proprietor and resident, had kindly thrown open for examination. Only the commander's house and the great hall now remain, and the latter, though unfortunately now having a wall built across it, is in other respects very perfect, and was now contemplated with much curiosity. Mr. Parker, though placing the date of the structure as it now appears not later than the reign of Henry VII, or perhaps later, stated his opinion that it was one of the finest of the date he had ever seen. The roof was very beautiful and perfect, the minstrel's gallery in its original state, and what was not often seen, the coved canopy of the dais of the high table yet remained. The oriel window was placed as usual, and in this recess the sideboard was generally placed, while the passage neared to the cellar. This oriel window is remarkable as being almost filled, and originally quite so with diamond panes, on each side of which is inscribed the word Emmanuel on a scroll, or else the representation of some animal or bird. The party then ascended the great staircase, with its curious massive balustrade, to an apartment above, with arched and coved ceilings such as in manor houses was called the solar or the lord's room, and which was here in a very perfect state. A hiding place communicating with the roof was also inspected over the stairs, which was traditionally called King Charles's Hole, though if anyone had ever hidden there, it must have been some other Charles and not the King. Yet curiously enough, a bedroom nearby is still called the First King Charles Room, and it is by no means improbable that the King visited the commandery while in Worcester. On the ground floor, Mr. Lees pointed out the room called the Duke of Hamilton's Room, which Mr. Mentz had assured him was always considered the room in which the Duke of Hamilton had died, after being mortally wounded in the Battle of Worcester. It was also traditionally reported that the body was buried in this room, and not taken to the cathedral until after the restoration. Although Mr. Mentz was very happy to show the members of the institute around the commandery, he is noted as being responsible for a lot of the damage to the historic fabric of the building. He had driven a carriageway through the Great Hall, and was responsible for the building of the unfortunate wall mentioned in the article. Although the wall was removed and the hall restored in the 1950s, traces of its presence may still be seen in the floor. The commandery's current state of preservation is owed to extensive restoration efforts in the 20th and 21st centuries. The party went on to turn their attentions to Worcester's best preserved historic streetscape, Friar Street. The old timber houses, which as representing what Worcester was in the 17th century, were regarded with great interest. The old hostelry attached to the Greyfriars, so considered by the late eminent antiquary John Britton, and now forming three houses with a wide archway in the centre, was particularly examined. The portion in which Mr. Bardin lives has not received such a visitation for many a day. He led his visitors up his wide staircase, and showed all his doors, casements and original knockers. He had mentioned a tradition that Queen Elizabeth had been entertained at that house, when she had visited Worcester, and it must at that time have been a mansion of some importance. It was supposed to be of the age of Henry VII. The building which receives particular attention in the article here is today known as the Greyfriars. The assessment that the building was a surviving part of the Franciscan Friary which had once stood alongside was debunked in the 1980s. Mr. Bardin is believed to have lived in the portion now known as the South Wing, from where he ran a school for poor children. The property was served with a compulsory demolition order in 1936, but was saved at the last moment by members of the Worcestershire Archaeological Society. Although the building was drastically altered during the restoration, it's clear to see that many elements described in the article remain. Thence down New Street to the Corn Market was the route, to see the quarters of Charles II when in Worcester. But though the timber structures on either side remain, the house he actually occupied was new fronted and modernised. It was however thought curious by Mr. Parker, that an old board now existing having Fear God 1577 Honour the King, should have been inscribed upon the house where Charles had his lodgings, previous to his coming to Worcester, but such mottos were not uncommon on old houses. 
That Charles II took lodgings on this plot during the Battle of Worcester is recorded by a stone slab erected on the front of the building. What many people do not realise is that the original house was much bigger, forming an L shape. Looking at the building from a distance, you can see where the corner plot was rebuilt following a fire in the early 19th century, as described in the article. The board mentioned by Mr Parker survives too, but looking at it we can see the author was mistaken in its wording. Instead of fear God, it reads love God. Across the corn market the party made their way to the church of St Martin. The modern chancel of which has been gothicised under the eye of Mr W J Hopkins by direction of the rector, the Reverend L Wheeler. The rich colours in the eastern window of stained glass put in by Mr Hardman was an object that elicited commendation, as well as the beauty of the Reredos. Other stained glass windows put in by benefactors within the last few years enrich the east end of the church. The clear description of the striking appearance of St Martin's interior can still be enjoyed today. Although much of the present appearance of St Martin's is attributed to its rebuilding in the 18th century, it's interesting to think that much of its colour provided by the stained glass was a relatively recent installation when the Archaeological Institute made their progress through the city in 1862. The Trinity was next invaded, and the quaint houses with open galleries examined there, much to the wonder of the inhabitants of that locality. After threading this passage, there appeared an indisposition in many to explore further. Although elements of the Trinity Guild complex survive, the modern location is drastically altered from how it appeared in 1862. Queen Elizabeth House is the only surviving example of what the article describes as a series of quaint houses with open galleries. And even this has since been moved from its original location when the street was widened in 1891. The old bridge house in Trinity Passage is thought by some to also have survived from the time of the Guild. Finally, the party made their way along the tithing to the site of the former Cistercian nunnery, commonly called the White Ladies. In the tithing, Mr Everill, who now resides at the White Ladies, courteously opened his grounds to the archaeologists, and they at once proceeded to the remains of the chapel of the Cistercian nuns who here had their abode. But they are very inconsiderable, only the eastern end remaining, showing some blocked up lancet windows. Mr Walker, from his inexhaustible manuscripts, recounted some particulars of the foundation of the nunnery, and the difficulties the poor white nuns were always in, notwithstanding having a farm, a wood, and various lands given to them at different times. At the west end of the chapel part of the crypt is visible, with a doorway or passage, popularly reported as leading to or connected with the crypt of the cathedral. Mr Parker and a few others scrambled down to the vault, but were obliged to leave it in the obscurity in which they found it, and the party, now rather tired with their diverse explorations, dispersed to prepare for the evening meeting. Two years after the article was published, the site of the White Ladies became occupied by Worcester's Royal Grammar School, which remains there to this day. The ruined east end of the Cistercian Chapel remains too, as does the popular legend concerning a subterranean passage connecting the building with the cathedral though no certain evidence has ever been uncovered to support this claim.